Hi, everybody. Dan here with TrendSpider, and this is Talking with Traders, a segment that I host here. Then today I have a very interesting and special guest, Howard Lindsden, the co-founder of StockTwits and so many other things, uh, a principal in a trading fund, a published author, and currently a, a VC. Howard, welcome. Hey, buddy. Hey. Good to have you on, man. It's good to good to see your face. It's been a while. The uh, it's fun to see you guys growing. You guys are oh, doing definitely a great growing. Job. Yep, you guys are doing a great job. Yeah. Uh, how long how long has it uh, uh, been since I've seen you in person? I feel like it's been a while. Maybe Chart Summit with JC. Yeah, like two years ago. Yeah, time flies. It's crazy. Yeah, we hit it off right away. So. Um, well, really cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here again. Um, you know, uh, I think we could start off. I usually ask everybody this. Um, how did you how did you originally stumble into the world of trading and stocks and investing? I think like a lot of people back 30 something years ago, it was. Get a, you get called by a stockbroker. Uh, you get cold called, uh, you end up on some list and I think that still kind of happens today, but it's via text. Uh, but you, you, I got cold called, I got pitched a, um, a stock clearly Canadian. It was kind of like just a, a beverage brand and out of Canada, I lived in Toronto. So I was at a Vancouver, uh, stock exchange. Uh, I, think I, I still remember the ticker, but it went to zero, put it that way. Okay. Uh, and and uh, that was my indoctrination into uh, the market. Nice. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, how'd you how'd you go from that? I know you had uh, at one point ran a fund, um, yeah. you know, an investment fund. How did you go from that to to uh, you know managing money professionally? It was a long time in between. So I was probably in late high school, and then I went to college. Uh, was not interested in the market. Um, and went to Arizona, Arizona State, and and to get my citizenship postgraduate school, um, you know, I wanted it was post Gulf War. It uh, I wanted to live in Arizona, and you know, it's much harder probably now to get a green card. But even back then, you know, Gulf War, uh, I just had to get a job and prove, you know kind of go through the whole thing with a, a green card or a work visa back in 90 and I was, back then there was no uh, craigslist or no internet and so you'd go to the newspaper and circle all these jobs you know we'll pay you and it was just yeah. a stock, and so i went to work at a stock brokerage doing what someone had done to me cold calling so that was kind of i had to get, stay in the states and i had a, even though i had an mba and a master's in international management i was I was making cold calls uh, just to get sponsored to live in the United States. And that was how I started falling in love with the market. You know, I build up this book of like one sheeters and value line pages and then cold call people and try and sell stock over the phone and uh, not easy to do, especially post 90 recession in, in Arizona at the SNL crisis. I didn't know enough to even know that it was a dumb idea. But I just fell in love with the numbers and with, uh, I was okay at cold calling. And I just loved the idea of like stocks, you know, and I really just started digging in. And, and that's, I don't know, 91, but it's almost 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, was a stockbroker and, and was making cold calls. You know, it's a, a funny, I don't need a cold call to, to lose a bunch of money on a stock. I, I'll do that all on my own. So. Me too. Me too. Um, that's cool. Um, did you, uh, when you were, when you were managing, uh, uh, you know, money professionally, were you, you know, long, short or what type of strategies did you employ? Yeah. So 94, 94, uh, one of my cold calls led to an investment company called the grip, which became like the pet rock of the ninety. It was, uh, um, and we made so much money. So I wasn't, I got out of the brokerage business to go chase my entrepreneurial dream of this cold call that I made, which was a, a stress ball called The Grip. And my partner made so much money. It was his company that we just started. It was the early 90s and we started trading because uh, we, we were just cash rich. And it was, luckily it was a bull market. So now I was on the other side of the phone call hiring brokers to pitch me ideas while I was 
making squeeze balls. So, you know, at one o'clock when uh, the market closed, I would go work at my, at this company that was growing really fast and we were trading stocks with our own money, but we had brokers working for us. And, you know, back then spreads were 50 cents on the NASDAQ, 75 cents. Like it's, people don't remember that. Now they complain about selling order flow. Whereas, you know, would you rather have 75 cent spreads on the stock? I mean, people don't realize that's where the spreads went. Uh, no free lunch. But um, I was so in love with, and people trusted, you know, my this family that I, you know, backed and now made a lot of money. They just were like, go do this full time. And I got a bunch of clients together didn't know what I was really doing and started a hedge fund in 98. It seemed like the entrepreneur, you know, being a hedge fund is like being an entrepreneur in tech, right? Like you work, you answer to no one except the returns on the market. And that seemed like a startup, you know, it really was a startup, but uh, it was really tough, you know, to, to kind of like compete against the world as a hedge fund. I survived, you know, 15 years doing that, but was never really happy doing it. So it was long short, but I really, tried everything and eventually settled on long-term trend following, which then pushed me even into longer term trend following, which is, you know, private tech investing where you're kind of locked in for seven to 10 years on your good companies, you know? So it's a, it's a different form of trend following, you know, obviously no liquidity, but it really fits my personality to just have a point of view and uh, just invest accordingly. And the public markets, you know, I, I apply the same things, but it's very hard to be a trend follower in public markets because you can see the price every day and you can add up what you're worth. And, uh, it, you know, it's a tough, you know, the markets are not the perfect thing for every personality. And my personality is more like I do better if I'm not looking at prices. You know, prices have so much data in them and they're fun. But private investing is so much more fun when you're not waking up every day, up or down, you know, a percentage. You're just thinking about the long term and, and the big vision. So it's, it's kind of been a, it's been a kind of a progression. And now I'm going full circle in that I think the markets of private and public have kind of like come together, you know, with cheap money and low interest rates and with technology, kind of everything's melded together. And now you're seeing it with SPACs, you know, and, I, and direct listings and companies staying private longer. And now it's like, it's almost cool to be private. It uh, is. But at the same time- And less work. It's cool to be public too. So uh, I think we're, we're finally converging where everything's kind of mushing together. It's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy that, that's going on in there because you're right, uh, companies are staying private longer. Um, and my, I mean, even uh, they're even, you know, at least, at least here in the Midwest, um, they're they're bootstrapping for longer before they're raising their initial seed investments, right? Sure. You know, you're seeing you're seeing companies, you know, try to try to go as long as they can until they can no longer, right? And then they, you know, go out and try to raise money. Yeah, um, what I've tried to tell, what you know, my job because I've been on both sides. A lot of people say they've been on both sides, but I've been on nine different sides of this, from trading to. Uh, liquid public momentum investing to like earliest stage seed investing. And I think, you know, it's become sexy to say you're, you're, you know, you've got venture capital, but you know, only a few companies really need to be venture backed. Most companies can be bootstrapped. And, and part of what we do is educate, you know, we're trying to find founders that really understand what we're doing and what they're getting themselves into when they partner with a venture capitalist, because it's a long marriage. It is. And, it's not for everybody. And I think, you know, because of maybe Facebook movie and because of all these giant, you know, trillion dollar companies, you know, everybody wants to be Zuckerberg, maybe not Zuckerberg as it exists today, but everybody wants to be Facebook or Alibaba or, uh, you know, uh, Google, um, you know, not everybody can be. And so you're trying to like educate people on like, the ups, the positives and negatives of, of, you know, taking outside capital. So I think yeah. we're now headed to a place, like you said, where especially in the Midwest where people, venture capital maybe wasn't as established where uh, it, it'll revert back to like bootstrapping and part of the, part of the art of the, of, of a startup. And you've done this a few times and I've done it both ways 
you know, taking money and bootstrapping hedge fund, et cetera, is that um, I think what's becoming cool again is take, is how the art of building a company with very little money is like, how do you do an Instagram? Like 14 people, no revenue, billion dollar exit versus raising 200 million. You know, part of the art of being a founder is like, how do you creatively get the highest valuation with the least amount of money and employees? That's kind of cool. So hopefully we get to that more in a world of the cloud and open source software. I think we're heading back to a world of, you know, and now you got COVID, which everybody's stuck in their home. I think the artisan digital entrepreneur and that it'll be cool to build a huge company out of your house. Yeah. And, and like, we're doing the best. like we're, you know, we're not going to judge people by the office that they, and how many people they employ. And uh, it's going to be part of, it'll be cool to say like, I built this thing with no employees. All yeah, it's the- interesting. I've seen, um, I've seen startups back in like the early tech, like cloud days do that where it's completely remote, no office, everything's just through like messaging and, and, you know, meetups. Um, but I haven't seen any like truly large organizations come up that way. They're starting to start to get lab. I mean, they're starting to, you know, elastic. There's all these like yeah. remote started companies that are now getting public or almost public and uh, uncentralized businesses from day one. And well, crypto is obviously a perfect example. Bitcoin mm-hmm. itself, you know, no employees. Um, we don't even know who it is. And it's got one of the biggest brands in the world. That's pretty cool. So in a yep. world where that's happening, like that's the ultimate other end of it, which is like, who the hell's Satoshi? And how do they do this? And who's making all the money? Is it the Russians? Is it the Americans? Is it the uh, CIA? Is it, you know what I mean? That is definitely the CIA. So. Yeah. Well, I'm saying like, we could argue like everybody has an opinion. It's pretty cool. It's kind of like the stock market, except no one knows. Nobody knows. So let me ask you uh, on the topic of uh, startup investing. You were you were uh, correct me if I'm wrong. A relatively early Robinhood investor. Yeah, we were seed when we invested. I met um, part of the part of the, one of the edges that I would say I have, I, and we could argue. I, I can't quantify if I truly have an edge, but you're you're an investor with me, so you kind of have taken the leap of faith yourself. Is um, or bought into or believe or are smart enough. We won't know until we add it all up at the end. Um, but part of my edge, I believe, is my network and my passion and domain experience around trading and investing. And I think in the past, it was like, how big of assets were you managing? And like, are you on CNBC? And do you wear fancy shoes and have homes in the Hamptons and are busy all the time? Versus today, it's like, you know, back in the day when farming or, or America was a different type of uh, pre, pre uh, digital or pre, you know, industrial age where it was how much land you own. You couldn't tell who a billionaire was. You wouldn't know if he was a farmer or a billionaire. And I think we're getting to that stage digitally right now. Absolutely. Where you don't judge a person by like their office or what they're wearing or, uh, you know, who they hang out with. You can't tell again, which is kind of cool. Yeah. And so my edge, I think, is around, I've been doing, whether I'm good or bad trader, I really know what I know. And I just want to continually invest in the industry that I know. And I'm focused on things that would make my life as an investor easier. And so when I started Stock Twits, it really was, it was inspired by Twitter. Okay. It was inspired by my disdain for CNBC and media, you know, before, before we were calling it fake news, um, you know, 2004, 2005. And um, I couldn't afford Bloomberg, you know, I wasn't going to pay two grand a month and I didn't read the wall street journal. So I was like, how does a guy like me beyond Yahoo message boards get information? And Twitter comes along and inspired me to kind of build Twitter for finance. Uh, FinTwit is what they call it, but we built our own platform called StockTwits. Yep. And, you know, 12 years later, we are the home of, you know, millions of, of traders and investors, lifestyle and professional, call them individuals. And because of that, I got good flow. I don't just have good flow of sentiment and, and opinions. 
I have good flow of founders who want to show me their product because they think, you know, we can help them because of our distribution and our brand, yep. et cetera, et cetera. So, so, you know, I just put on the hat sideways and put on my long-term hat and realized that I had a seat that many others didn't have. And if I was willing to write checks, uh, and which I did, um, I could get a seat at the table of, you know, 50, 100 of these companies aiming to be the next Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal, et cetera. And, and that's what I did. In 2005, I just started writing checks to change the world, conform to how I thought the world should work for traders and investors. Mm -hmm. And so Robinhood came to me, they had a, a different app. They were struggling. It was called Kronos Research. They had built like a social network, a social app, and it wasn't working. And they had, were um, high frequency traders. So they were really smart guys. And they just figured out if we put a front end on what we've learned about high frequency trading and we could bring the commissions you know, front end and a good design, we could create a free commission brokerage. And they pitched me and I immediately was hooked. You know, I, I didn't have the nerve or the knowings or, you know, back in 2013, when they pitched me, being a broker was not something anybody wanted to do, right? Everybody was hacking. Yeah. Everybody wanted to be Vanguard, right? It was like, ah, we don't need to be a broker. I don't want to be a broker. There's too many regulations. Yeah, robo advisor. The world of Uber was like, don't ask for permission, you know, just fucking do it and pay fines later. You can't do that in US financial markets. So what, what the hack was for the venture capitalists, and it was a little lazy and what they, I think they got wrong at, at VC scale is they all wanted to be the next Vanguard. And I never believed in that model. I was anti-Vanguard, not as a company, just like Vanguard works. Like if you can't build a 10 times better product than free, which is basically Vanguard at scale. So yeah. I was zigging while they were zagging. You know, we were stock twits and we were all about individual stock picking and having fun and trying to beat the market. I don't even know what that means, beating the market. We're, we're seeing <laughs> that now, right? Like that means nothing. Um, but I was all in on do-it-yourself investing. And so the idea of a brokerage in a box and software was just the right time, right place. They built the right product. And, you know, we invested in 2014, um, a couple hundred thousand dollars and it was an 8 million valuation and people really thought we were nuts, but I, I really believed the minute we wrote the check that it was going to be a billion dollar company. I didn't know if it could be at eight, you know, today it's there's on paper, 8 billion, but, um, that's the way we're all learning, whether it's DocuSign, no one thought it could be as big a company as, as it could be the market cap. I think in a digital cloud era, what we're learning is these companies can be much bigger than anybody imagined. Yeah, they can truly scale. So let me well, ask you. And they were truly outside the spreadsheet. You know, Wall Street yeah. is really an Excel-based industry and an asset and leverage-based industry. And now we're at, now we're leveraging the cloud. And we're leveraging and imagination. And imagination and creativity, uh, which yep. is, you know, brings us full circle to why there's SPACs today is because Wall Street can't, can't grasp what these entrepreneurs are coming up with. And there's no assets involved, right? You hook up to Azure, you hook up to Google Cloud, or you hook up to AWS and you're in business. You know, yep. 99, you had a fucking, to do pets.com, you needed $10 million for servers. To do pets.com 3.0, you don't need anything. You just yeah, need a website and, and some Facebook ad spend and you test and you figure out if you can ARB, you know, customer acquisition. So, so we've really, you know, blown through Wall Street. Wall Street kind of, hurt themselves with their behavior and with leverage and then Bitcoin comes along and now angel investment comes along and now direct listings comes along uh, and we're slowly seeing what I thought I didn't couldn't have predicted this but it was what I was investing everything I disliked is still around but you can beat them using free software which is pretty sure. cool which is which is I guess the original vision I mean, it, it, it's, I'll tell you, like having started Trendspider during this time, it's- And I knew it. I called you right away. I go, I love what you're doing. And you did. You did. But, but the point I want to make is it just blows my mind. Because when we were doing like mid-phase and single hop back in the day, right? Want a billing system? Write the code, right? Find a payment gateway. You want a phone system? Buy the box. Buy the phones, right? Everything was 
you know, had to be piecemealed and built and glued together. Now it's like Ring Central, Grasshopper, right? Twilio, you know, CRM, there's 50 Spotify. choices. Uh, right. So it's, just, it's, it's a completely different world. I'm with you there. That, that is the future there. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, um, during the COVID time, right? So like the last like three, four months, right? Like 4 million new traders opened brokerage accounts. Yeah, I wouldn't have predicted that. I'm a little bit lucky there, but. Blew my mind too. Um, what do you think is driving that? Is it just a government money? Uh, well, first of all, what's driving is the stock market's a game. Like, I don't like saying that, but let's face it. The fact that we're playing a multiplayer, multi-dimensional, multi-behavioral, multi off the same data set, right? Price, which is large data and small. I mean, it's fascinating, but we're Fortnite 24-7, 365, no coders. <laughs> It's just my brain against your brain and my will against your will and my pockets against your pockets and my knowledge of, or my imagination against your imagination and anybody can play. It's like, why did poker take off? Why did, um, first of all, you either like poker or you didn't like poker. I, I, yeah. I, I don't like the grind of sitting at a table, but, uh, but that's why did online poker take off? Because a fucking peasant in, 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 Bangladesh could go up against a CEO of a fortune 500 company and clean his clock, uh, you know, because they're sitting at yeah. the same table. And I think what we have with COVID and the markets is and Robin hood and stock twits and Reddit and telegram and you know what I mean? And, tr and yeah. friend spider and, and uh, you have unbelievable access. You have time, you have liquidity you have uh, you have mentorship, you know, and that's a perfect cocktail for people trying to make a buck. And it's, so it's, everything's just sped up, and we're just gaming and finance and sports are kind of all intertwined. And um, it just I wouldn't have predicted it. I mean, I always thought that more people would trade, but we needed a trigger because eventually my kids get the money. Your kids will get the money. Mm -hmm. uh, and we may hate our kids. We may love our kids. But we, you know, they could be Trump's. They could be Biden's. We don't know. Right. Like, you know, they, they could no. go, they're going to make mistakes, but eventually they get the money trickles down. And the next, my big vision is the next class. The next generation will be an investing class, meaning, you know, it'll come from putting money to work creatively right less from production and less from marketing uh, i'm mean, no, not less from marketing, less from you know manufacturing yeah. and less from the ground and more from the cloud and uh so in that world the faster kids learn to invest and in, and develop a style of how they're going to manage money because uh, that's what's going to separate the next generation is how well they invest um so this was a onboarding moment for the next generation and we can argue about will they stick or is it good or is it bad i don't know but odds are once you get the bug once you onboard 30 million people a certain percentage are going to stick and then of that certain percentage that stick they're going to want tools mm -hmm. and so i just need to think through oh if they have tools like what are the modern tools that a young person would need yep and that's kind of what i'm focused on so so I wouldn't have predicted it, but I'm super bullish on this not going away because it's a lifestyle and it's a pretty good lifestyle. If you get mentored properly and you invest properly, uh, it'd be pretty crazy to, to tell someone they shouldn't do it is ridiculous. To tell someone they shouldn't buy a gun and smoke is ridiculous because it's just half, it just is mm -hmm. you know, all day, but to tell someone they can't buy Facebook or fractional share. And then you have the fractional ownership it's just kind of should have been around 20 years ago, but like uh, it's finally here and everybody's, everybody can do it. And then you have the international world that wants to own us companies. That's a big thing. It's a big thing. Like, so yeah, I've been learning about that lately. So everybody that thinks this is a bubble, it is in some levels a bubble. There's always bubbles, but at some level, this is the earliest days where, you know, if you're in Singapore, you can't buy U.S. stocks. If you're in Germany, you can't go buy Facebook. Uh, and so we're in an area where 
people around the world are going to want to be able to buy fractional shares of the companies they want. We're buying Tencent and Alibaba. Why can't the people in other countries buy Facebook, Microsoft, Twilio, etc.? Makes sense. Do you think the market's acting rationally? It never does. It always does and it always doesn't. Uh, I think at some massive scale, it's acting very rationally, right? You have all this money printing. You have very few pure digital incredible companies that that have that don't have to print money right so in a world where the government's just printing money around the world apple we could argue about the buybacks forever but in a world where apple isn't infinitely printing their stock and doesn't need money or can borrow it at zero percent a share a share of apple is a rare asset or a share of amazon is a rare asset um and it produces cash flow so it's not just yeah. gold, it produces cash flow and is a badge of honor. So in a world of rare assets, I call them rare digital assets, I think it makes sense. You know, what are they worth? I don't know. I'm not going to argue about, you know, I'm a, tr I'm a, I'm a dumb trend follower, but, um, and, and, and people getting out of Disney and Carnival Cruise Line and airlines makes total sense to me. They're shitty businesses. They are. And, and, and they've used the public to, f they fleece the public over and over again to build conglomerates to hide the fact that the core business is shitty. It is. So if I'm a new investor, I just wanna know, can, if, I buy, do, if I'm buying Disney for Disney Plus, shouldn't I just buy Netflix and own the piece of the business that I like? Meaning, so until Disney splits off or, or until Netflix has true competition, from a stock perspective, if someone wants to own streaming, they're going to buy Netflix stock. If someone, sure. you know, so so we've gone from an era of conglomerates on land to an era of conglomerates in the cloud, and but now you're probably going to see a lot of like the Twilios and Shopify's, these new conglomerates, kind of underneath the conglomerates, and that's kind of where I'm focused. Is like who are the next planets? You know, is it going to be? Twilio, or is it going to be Peloton versus Lulu, uh, is not, you know, all the acquisitions that come with it. So I think it's behaving somewhat rationally, king-making. And then irrationally is it's been completely politicized. No one wants to take the pain of a true bear market. Um, so I think part of the fun that's taken out of this game is the government's kind of become in control of the market at some level. The and you're betting- team. Yeah, you're betting on when they'll flinch. And that kind of takes the skill out of it a little bit because they don't really flinch. It feels a little bit rigged. Yeah. So, so that part I dislike. And that's why I like private investing more is like it's truly the skill of picking and and riding these things and building something. And I think that's why private investing has caught on as the as the public markets have gotten more politicized post 2008. Uh, but starting earlier with the plunge protection team in 98, um, I think people feel gypped. So it's obvious to why private markets have become so interesting. You have all this money, you have all this knowledge, you have all this new industry and the public markets are a bit of a joke uh, because of the politicization of it. And therefore we're gonna have to fix that to make the stock market a healthy place for true price discovery. And COVID kind of brought back a little price discovery and that's what you get. When you get price discovery, you get volatility. Yeah, and we've been VIX over 30 for months. And, you know, that's pretty amazing. It's a lot of fun if you're trading it. Yeah, it's a lot right. of fun. It just yeah. doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. So they're yelling, but that's what you wanted. You either get calm or you get volatile. I prefer volatile. I personally do too, um, you know, but I think it's less rig. The more volatile, the yeah. less rigged it feels. And I mean, price discovery is the product that traders sell. I mean, it's why it's why this is even a thing. So it could so. last twenty years. Therefore, I'm super bullish on the markets. I don't care if they go to two thousand or a hundred thousand, as long as there's price discovery and volatility. Fascinating take. That's that's yeah. really interesting. Um, yeah, we're I, seeing I didn't the, it that way. And I think yeah, there's a new discovery of mine because nothing static is that when we invested in Robinhood, the whole what got me excited about it being a billion dollar idea was, okay, well, people want choice. It's Uber of trading. 
what makes me excited and more bullish today, forgetting price for a moment on Robinhood is, well, now they have 10 million users and now millennials know that owning 500 S&P stocks is the stupidest fucking scam part of my French. Why the hell, why do I want to own, when I walk into Walgreens and I'm like dizzy from looking at the Band-Aid aisle where there's 500 choices, uh, I really only want one Band-Aid. So when I'm investing, if I want fitness, I want to own Peloton or Lulu. I don't want to own a conglomerate that has a fitness division. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think we're going to have this unbundling of the S&P, which happens all the time, you know, bundling, unbundling. So I think part of the, the market cap explosion in finance finally is that Vanguard has just been this monopoly and Wall Street's kind of been humming this like 60, 40 and just set and forget. And, you know, you're diversified with 500 stocks. And I believe, you know, we're seeing that you can be diversified with five companies, right? They're 23% yeah. of the S&P. So just buy those five and then pick 10 other companies that you think could get to that category. One shots, right? And you got a diversified portfolio. Why do you need to own Nokia and Carnival Cruise Line and, and uh, an airline and an energy company and a beverage company? It it's seems fascinating. Like it would, if you it look at like uh, that, would be drag. Uh, kids don't like drag. They're carrying around their phone, and they're wearing Lulu, and they have one pocket, and they don't want to have a lot of stuff. And that's translating into the market too. They don't need 500 stocks to feel diversified. So what, what I wanted to, what I wanted to comment there, um, if you look at Robin Track, which is a website that tracks okay. Robinhood, it's okay. painful because it's like. You know, Carnival Cruise, Hertz, bankrupt Hertz, right? You know, these are like top 50 holdings of Robinhood accounts. There are like 40,000 Robinhood accounts. So how is that different than a stockbroker calling me in the 90s or 80s to buy a beverage company, right? So there's, people are going to do stupid things. So you give people weapons and they're going to do them. It's like you give them Twitter, they're going to send spam or send hate. You give them the stock market for free and they're going to do stupid things. Part of this is that culture of, uh, it's like their version of dare, right? I'm going to buy a hundred thousand shares of Hertz because I know that it's kind of like Wall Street. I know that in two days, there's a bunch of other dumb millennials that are going to buy it at a higher price. So it's a game of chicken more than, it's a digital game of chicken. Uh, they know that it's bankrupt. But they also know that the way information asymmetry works is that the other idiots, they'll sell it to another idiot in two days. And as long as they know there's a liquidity, they're trading it. So right or wrong, I agree, it's stupid. But they're just playing their own version of chicken. And some people are going to get burned. And then they're going to go back and either quit or they're going to get smarter and stop doing that. It's like fire. Uh, yeah. you know, they want to light matches and set their ass on fire. They're going to do it. So Hertz is just part of the learning process. Um, and to be honest, they learned a quick lesson, right? Hertz tried to scam everybody and do an offering. Um, guess what? That got shut down. So Good. the real scam was Hertz was trying to fucking capitalize on that nonsense. Yeah. And so, Can't blame them. Opportunism is what drives. But that's what I'm saying. Where do you draw the line on who you're protecting, right? Like it's just, mm -hmm. it's just chaos. But people have to learn. So, so I don't think you can regulate all this stuff, right? Like it's a, it's listen, it's a Pandora's box. You know, it's not a perfect situation. Um, but, but at the same time, man, fooling his money is part of the business. It's a game, and if people are gonna try and break the rules, they're gonna get hurt. That and, makes sense. Yeah. So I don't know. I, but those are the things I think, I think the faster we get people onboarded and, and educated, the better the game becomes. The quicker they learn their lessons, the better they'll be. Right. Yeah. So um, let's, uh, we're running a long time. So let's wrap it up here. I got one uh, final question for you. Um, mm -hmm. And I ask everybody this, but since you're the founder or co-founder of stock twits, I'm going to ask it to you in a special way. Um, what advice would you give a completely new trader or investor looking to get into this as it relates to social media in their trading? Should they listen to it? Should they tune it out? What's the right way to use it? Because a lot of people use it wrong. Right? Yeah, well, most people use it wrong. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an edge. So there's like an incredible edge 
Um, so the first thing I would do is definitely open a free brokerage account like a Robin Hood, <clears throat> because whether they're selling order for what, don't get paranoid about that stuff. I mean, lower your costs, right? And by lowering your costs, I mean, yeah, okay, so you're paying an extra five cents indirectly, probably somewhere. But, you know, I did, I did find with 75 cent NASDAQ spreads, I still love the business, right? So we're, no matter what, who's selling what to who, you're seeing real prices on your phone. Uh, so build a watch list, fill that watch list. So open a Robinhood account, fill that watch list with 20 companies, brands that you fucking adore and live with every day. And just start watching them for three to six months. There's no rush. Or buy one share, or put you know 500 bucks to work across eight to ten companies that you just live with every day. You know whether it's Lulu or Nike or or Disney or Netflix or Google or Amazon or Tencent, and just watch the prices and start to get a feel for the mood of uh, the market. Then I would, you know, obviously find a few friends that use social media for financial and find out who they follow. And then to speed through everything is like, just like you would take a Udemy class or a Khan Academy or go spend money at college. Say, I'm gonna put 500 bucks a year into being mentored, like a coach, like you would a psychologist or you would uh, a therapist or a golf coach. And say, I'm gonna pay for the best you know, and I'm not going to buy into this crap. Well, oh, if they were good at the market, they would just be trading. No, there's hundreds of great mentors that may not manage money, but are happy to, for a hundred bucks a month or 50 bucks a month, share ideas True. and coach you. And so pay for mentorship. That'll speed you through social, like pay to play, right? Mm -hmm. There's that thing, pay to play. And everybody's used to free, go around the free, borrow money from your parents and invest in market education and try and speed the 10 year life cycle of learning cycles and business and ups and downs and try and speed that up to three years, maybe four years or two years, depends on how good you are or how natural your ability is or finding your style and finding the mentor that helps you invest is key. And so those are like the simple things that I would do like pay, don't pay for commissions, Think longer term and then find people that are smart and then draft behind those people and ask for and pay for mentorship. That's good advice, Howard. Thank you. I'm sure a lot of people will appreciate that. Um, when, uh, 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 one, one last question, uh, sure, sure. you know, uh, so, you know, I, I think uh, some people watching might be just curious about that kind of same question, but going into, you know, starting a VC fund or an investment fund, you know, there, there's a lot of ambitious people out there. If somebody was like just new and was like, Hey, you know, um, I kind of want to get, become an investor, invest in startups. Yep. You know, what advice would you give them? It's a great question. It's something that I think about all the time because how did I do it? I luckily had some money and I could ask favors and beg and borrow. But you know, the only way you learn is by writing checks. And that's whether it's a hundred dollar investment in Google on, on Robinhood, or you want to put a thousand dollars in a startup and go on angel list. Uh, but the first thing you do is start a journal and act, and act as if, because it's free to write and you don't have to share it. And you don't have to, you can keep it like a private journal if you want and start building a model portfolio. Start timelining what you were thinking and which companies you would buy if you had the money. Because at some point, if you're good, you can. that's your resume, right? So there's a lot of kids now being hired in VCs that didn't go to Harvard, um, didn't invest their hard-earned money because they clearly wrote what if they had a hundred grand, what 10 companies they would have invested in. And they have, they have WordPress or Medium or Twitter and that's digital footprint of what they would have done. So, so a fantasy portfolio, it's never too early to start. Okay, so if you were wrong, you don't have to share it with anybody, but if you really want to break into the business, start keeping track of your investments, even if you didn't make them by writing it down and keeping yourself honest. And I think, the journal would be the, la you know, I probably forgot to say this in the last question. The, the last is write this shit down and hold yourself accountable. Uh, and that, that pays dividends. I've been writing forever, but, you know, it's fun to look back and see what I was thinking. And, oh, I just go, I can't believe I missed that. Or I can't yeah. believe I was right and sold my shares. So I'm, 
I'm super, you know, I'm super, I, I believe in the fantasy portfolio for private investors. So if you want to break in the business, write it down, go to read as much as you can, try and figure out which trends are going to be around. And then someone will discover you. You will get discovered. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Howard. And thank you for being here. Um, I think we're, I think we're a little over time actually. So we're going to have to cut the se segment off. How did I? Um, oh, yeah. I wish I would talk to you. I would talk to you for days, man. Like I want to get together and have some beers together because because we can have some fun. You get married. My wife doesn't want to talk to me. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's a, that's the trader's problem. They're all like this weird group that no one else wants to talk to except we just can talk all day. Uh, de degenerates are good with other degenerates. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, I really do appreciate you, Howard. Thank you for being here. I hope everybody enjoyed this. And um, you know, off uh, back to Jake. <laughs>